Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Annie Talvasto, and I am a CNCF ambassador as well as a senior product marketing manager at Camunda, and I will be your host tonight. Um, so every week we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with cloud native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, and they will answer all of your questions. So join us every Wednesday to watch live as you are maybe doing now. Welcome very much. Um, so this week we have Reza here with us to talk about multi-architectural Kubernetes clusters. And as always, this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such, it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, um, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Reza to kick uh, today's presentations off. Hello, and thank you for the warm welcome. Um, let me just share my screen without disabling my webcam. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, today I'm going to talk about multi-architectural Kubernetes clusters. Uh, hello, uh, as Annie was so kind enough to introduce me, my name is Reza. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera. Uh, Tigera is the company behind the open source project Calico. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I like staring at binary files until I can spot decimal numbers in them. Uh, I'm always eager to learn new stuff and open to suggestions. So let's connect and exchange ideas. Um, by the end of this talk, uh, you'll be able to convert your x86 containers to run in an ARM environment and set up a Kubernetes cluster with multiple CPU architecture that can run those workloads that you converted. Uh, this will help you spend less money on cloud providers while, while gaining a better performance. Um, this talk is divided into uh, six sections, and I'm going to talk about Project Calico and give you an overview of what it is and what we do. Um, then I'm going to explain what I mean by a multi-architectural cluster. Uh, there will be some promising benchmarks about Redis and Nginx that I've done before. Uh, then I'll demo how to set up a multi-architectural cluster using Amazon EKS. After that, we will check out how easy it is to prepare your applications for an ARM environment. And finally, if everything goes right, I'll demo the migration process. Um, if you got any questions, please type it in chat. Uh, I'll try my best to answer it at the end of each section or at the end of presentation. If I don't know the answer to your question, which by my experience is going to be a lot of times, uh, please remind me in Project Calico Slack and I'll try to connect you with people who know way more than me that can help you with it. All right, so an overview about Calico. Now, what is Project Calico? Project Calico is a community behind a pure layer three approach to virtual networking and highly scalable data centers. Uh, by layer three, I mean IP and routing. Uh, Calico is an open source networking and network security solution for containers, virtual machines, and native host-based workloads. It is important to note that Calico is not just a Kubernetes CNI. In fact, Calico supports a broad range of platforms, including OpenShift, Mirantis, OpenStack, and bare metal services. Project Calico is an active community about cloud networking and security. So feel free to join our community using these social networking handles and drive the conversation where you see a need for a change or seek help for your uh, Calico journey from developers who are actively working on the project. All right, so 
let's get a start. What is multi-architectural cluster? Um, before we can talk about that, let's talk about what are the benefits and why should we care? Um, in every project, there are a variety of workloads. Um, these workloads can run more efficiently by using different processors, which will result in cost saving and performance boost. Um, as an example, if you're using an in-memory database like Memcached or Redis, uh, you will achieve a better performance and have to pay less money using an ARM architecture rather than x86. Um, now that we know the benefits and hopefully saving money is an intriguing fact for you, uh, let's talk about what I mean by multi-architectural cluster. When participating nodes in a cluster have different CPU architectures, we have a multi-architectural cluster. Usually when we create a Kubernetes cluster, we use an Intel or AMD CPU, which is based on x86 or AMD64 architecture. Uh, we can verify this in the first picture. Uh, both nodes are based on AMD64 architecture. In a multi-architectural cluster, we use nodes that have different processors, allowing us to divide the workload based on their processing needs. If you look at the second picture, where I'm going to draw a circle, um, an ARM64 node is participating in this cluster. Uh, by the way, AMD64 refers to the 64-bit uh, nature of the processor, and it's not a brand. This is a historical thing because in race to 64-bit, AMD was the first uh, to achieve it, and we still refer to them as AMD64. Um, now, what is ARM? ARM is a family of processors running on the RISC architecture. Uh, RISC is referred to processors that use a few amount of highly optimized instructions to do a task very quickly. Fun fact, ARM uh, is a chip company that doesn't mass produce chips. Their business model is to provide licenses to other companies, allowing them to design their own custom built processors using ARM's patented technology. What is the difference between ARM and x86? Um, the main difference can be traced back to the way these CPUs execute instructions. x86 tries to achieve more calculations by running one instruction and firing a chain of other instruction to have a more dynamic approach to computing. This is because when x86 was being developed, memory was quite slow and expensive. ARM, on the other hand, uses a simple instruction to do one thing and one thing only, making it more efficient in some scenarios and less power hungry. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert in these two architectures in any way, but if you're interested to know more, there's a link at the end of this presentation that will assist you in your computer architecture journey. All right, so who uses ARM? Wherever power efficiency is needed, ARM shines. Smartphones are a great example of this. Most smartphones and tablets are using customized CPUs that are based on ARM design. Many laptop manufacturers are also migrating to ARM architecture because of its power efficiency. Apple's newest line of processors, um, M1 family, is arguably one of the most known examples of that at this time. Another area that ARM processors are used is supercomputers. Fugaku, the world's fastest supercomputer at the moment, is powered by ARM processors. While all these areas are interesting on their own, um, I'm only going to talk about ARM-based processors in the cloud, so forgive me. Uh, what about the cloud? 
Amazon launched their custom design processor uh, Graviton back in 2018, allowing users to choose ARM64 architecture and cloud using uh, A1 general purpose EC2 instances. In 2019, Amazon introduced Graviton 2, an upgrade to their last gen CPUs, providing a variety of instances, which are called M6 family with better price to performance ratio. Uh, so what does got to do with cost saving? This is an estimate generated by AWS estimation tool. As you can see, an M6G ARM instance at the top of the picture with the same amount of resources is 20% cheaper than an M5 x86 instance at the bottom. That is the money incentive that I was talking about, but let's check out some benchmark to verify the performance boost. All right, so these benchmarks are created using M6G ARM instance and M5 x86 instance that are introduced in the previous slide. It is worth mentioning that except the CPU uh, and price, everything else is identical inside these instances. Um, among the operations that Redis can do, get and set are two examples of ARM64 performance boost that we can uh, refer to. As you can see uh, in the left picture, in the same amount of time, Redis on an ARM instance can run more than 113,000 set of operations, while an x86 can only do around 6,600 operations. Same is true for GET. As it is shown in the right picture, ARM64 can run more operations than x86 in the same amount of time. In fact, uh, Redis performance gain is not just limited to get and set. All Redis operations gain a considerable performance boost when we use an ARM64 instance in comparison to an x86 instance, as it is shown in this slide. All right. At this point, I feel like I owe a brief description of what is an R uh, an um, in-memory uh, database. Traditionally, databases used storage to store data. Upon request, they transfer that portion of information into RAM, and after a query is done, they might uh, leave it inside the RAM to be used as some sort of cache and speed up the next lookup process. In-memory databases, on the other hand, you use the RAM to store the data. When a query is issued, it is directly retrieved from the RAM, resulting in an eye-catching performance boost. Uh, In-memory databases can use the storage as well, but it is mostly used to create snapshots as a form of backup, since information in RAM are not persistent and can be purged with a power outage. All right, so next project. As it is described on Nginx websites, Nginx is an open source software for web serving, reverse proxying, uh, media streaming, you, know it, you name it. Um, Nginx is quite popular these days. As a matter of fact, Netcraft, a website dedicated to analyzing many aspects of the internet, including the market share of web servers showing Nginx as the leader of market share between all sites among web server developers, as you can see in their uh, chart for 2021. Um, this is my benchmark uh, of Nginx using, again, x86 and ARM64 nodes. Again, except the CPU architecture and the price, everything else is identical inside these instances. 
As it is shown in the picture, x86 falls short with around 6 million requests per second, while ARM64 is able to reach 8 million in the same time frame. If there is no question, we could get to the demo. Yeah, not so far, but uh, leave all of your questions to the chat so we can get them at the end of the presentation. And if no one else asks anything, I will have plenty of questions, so no worries. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> not too hard or anything, no worries. Hopefully. So um, for the demo, uh, I had to uh, prepare an x86 EKS cluster because it takes around 30 minutes to uh, create one. Um, if you're uh, new to EKS, don't worry. I got you covered. There's a link at the end of this presentation, the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, guide that can help you throughout the whole journey, even creating the benchmarks and uh, running everything from scratch. Um, so, at the moment, I only have one cluster, which, as I said, I created earlier. Um, if we could check the nodes, architecture. At the moment, there is one AMD64 instance inside my cluster. Now, since I'm using EKS cattle, uh, I have to run some other EKS cattle that can add a, an ARM64 node group to my uh, cluster. Um, this is a basic EKS cattle create node, which we just say create a node group for me for this cluster as you can see with this name, I want one node inside my uh, node group and the node type is M6G, which I talked about earlier. And M6G is a large instance, giving it like eight gigafram. Now, if you run this command inside EKS cattle version 0 0.65 till 72, you will get an error, which I'm going to show you. And the error talks about the manifests that EKS cattle is using. Um, this is because most of the manifests are not uh, multi-platform friendly in those releases of EKS cattle. In order to update these manifests, you just need to run a simple command that tells EKS cattle that I like to update my core DNS, AWS node, and coop proxy manifests. Again, if you like to know the commands that I'm running, don't worry about it. There is a link at the end that shows everything. All right, so when you are done updating these three components, you can run the uh, node group command to create an ARM64 node group. By the way, the thing that this command is doing is adding an ARM64 to, the, uh, to each manifest, allowing it to match the architecture of ARM64, which is the architecture of the node that we are going to create. Um, in EKS cattle, I think it's 0 0.65 or 66. When you do the coop proxy update, you will still get uh, an error, which you can fix it by getting rid of the coop proxy daemon set altogether and asking EKS cattle to force create the add-on manually. 
hopefully when you've done all of these, things will work and you can create your node group without any problems. Yay. All right, so let's get back to the presentation. Okay. Now, while the EKS Cattle is busy with AWS Cloud Formation, uh, let's talk about how to prepare applications for an ARM environment. Um, adopting ARM might seem complicated at first because of the huge toll that might be involved with preparing an application for an, for an ARM environment. However, with more and more programming languages leaning toward multi-platform and cross-compilation support, this gap is getting narrower every day. Unless you have a project coded in assembly language or a heavily optimized C code for a specific architecture environment, there's a huge chance that converting your containers will just take one command. Um, talk about converting. Linux containers are a great example when it comes to converting containers. Linux can be configured to use a kernel, an optional kernel feature called bin FMT miscellaneous that can match the beginning of a, bi a binary file and identify which interpreter is suitable in order to execute. This can help to compile your container for a different architecture without investing in hardware resources. This is needed because inside Linux, when you create a container, it shares the host kernel and host kernel is usually using the CPU architecture, not usually every time. So with using bin FMT miscellaneous, we can emulate that architecture, which is suitable for our application. Project MultiArc, which I'm borrowing their logo, uh, it uses the same concept to emulate various CPUs inside Linux containers. Now, let's check out how we can convert Google Microservices Demo to run an ARM environment. Um, for any of you who are not familiar, Google Microservices Demo or Online Boutique is a fictional web-based shop where you can search for items you love, uh, put them in your basket and check out without spending any real money. More importantly, it is a project with 11 microservices written in a variety of programming languages, begging to prove that I might be wrong about uh, one command conversion claim that I made earlier. All right, so let's head back to the demo. Hopefully, yep, cloud formation is going strong. All right, so this is the microservices folder. If you like to download microservices, it is uh, available in GitHub. You can uh, clone it, download it. There are uh, many, many documents and tutorials about how it works and what are the components in it. As I said, the important thing for me in this presentation is the amount of languages that is included inside this project, which makes it uh, more or less a real world scenario. So inside uh, microservices demo, there is a folder called SRC. And these are the source files for creating these containers that are components inside the demo application. So microservices, SRC, and let's pick first one at service. All right, so 
I'm using Docker. And in order to build, um, we can check out there is a Docker file indicating that this container can be built with Docker build command. So usually we should be able to build this using Docker build and a dot. We can add a tag to push it later. Oops. All right. Uh, what we can do to create this container is just run Docker build normally. Um, for creating it in terms of R, we can use the buildix, which is their uh, multi-threaded with uh, more caching flexibility uh, toolchain. And we can add platform which could indicate what are the architectures that we want to run this container on. Now I'm going to run this on ARM64. By the way, uh, when you run Buildix, it doesn't export the container at the end to your local uh, repository. You either need to add dash dash load or dash dash push to push it into the Docker repository, given that you are uh, logged in inside Docker. So with that, we could run this command and it will give us an error because Docker build is, oops, oh. I'm doing something wrong, and it's this one. Sorry. Linux ARM64. Yep. All right. And that's the ARM services on its glory. And I can say create this for both AMD64 and ARM64 and push it into my Docker repository on the internet, which hopefully runs and there will be no error. While this is building, I can try to pull Where we should be able to, yep. So CNCF Live a few seconds ago. And if we check the latest tag, there is an ARM64 and AMD64 uh, image for my container. Now let's go back and, all right, this is finally done. We could check out the nodes. And I have an AMD64 and an ARM64 in my cluster. Fun fact, for some reason, EKS Bottle Rocket uh, version is mismatched in AMD64 and ARM64. There is one minor version difference between these two releases. So if you're using a cutting edge uh, feature, make sure that the kernel got it. And with that, we should be able to
services which will populate all my pods this will take a second and if Populate the pods, which will be back to check it later. In the meanwhile, we can get back to the presentation. Hopefully, there is no question. And no question so far. <laughs> great. Yeah, so. yeah, perfect. So, I talked about how to run Kubernetes cluster with multiple CPU architectures and how to migrate your containers to work on ARM. I strongly believe that you can save a lot of money and resources if you start converting some of your workloads to run on ARM. Um, if you like to create the demo cluster and take it for a spin, check out my GitHub repository. Everything is there. Um, you can see the address in the top of the slide. Uh, and don't be shy to contact me if something goes wrong. Um, I'm reachable at these social places and Calico users Slack like, if you like to shout at me. Um, these are the resources that I used for this presentation. Um, again, as I promised, uh, there is the entrance to the ARM rabbit hole at the end of this slide. As you can see, developerarm.com. Um, if you're a big fan of free stuff uh, like me, um, make sure to grab your copy of the Kubernetes Security and Observability ebook from our website, taigera.io. It describes the key concepts, the best strategy, and technology choices available to support your environment. In fact, there is a chapter dedicated to workload deployment controls that goes into more details about container images and CI CD that I've used as an inspiration for my how to create ARM containers. Uh, and some of the choices that I made to do the ARM64 migration. Question. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. If there is any questions from the audience, now is the perfect time to ask them. Um, so fire away with those. And if I understood correctly, if anyone has a question after this, you know, they realize that uh, they should have asked that or this. Um, I think you said that they can go to the um, Calico Slack to ask yes. more questions. Yes, that is correct. That's it's always still good trying to load. Yeah, these two are still trying to load. Yeah. Everything takes always longer when you're like in a presentation. <laughs> that is true. And um, things are like always running into issues like dash tag. I don't even know how that get in there, but all right, there's a dash tag, I guess. Yeah, it's the demo effect. It, it happens no. every single time. Yes, yeah. that and, is true. Yeah, and thank you to JT Han, 24 Jaten, um, uh, for your comment on great and thank you. So as, as I said, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so questions from everyone, anyone, um, while we see if any of them rolls in, um, I want to ask, so this was a great presentation into the, the current things that's happening with Project Calico. Um, so what is the future? Do, is there any kind of feature roadmap or what's going to, what's going to be next for the project? So, uh, Project Calico is at the moment trying to uh, work on eBPF and eBPF is uh, 
as you know, uh, usually used in AMD64. So with this uh, ARM64 uh, movement that is happening inside cloud, we're hoping to like expand the horizon for people who like to spend less money and use features like eBPF and stuff in their clusters. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, and, and thanks, Jason, again, for commenting. And they don't have any questions for now. But as mentioned before, hop on over to the Slack if you have any later on. Um, another question from me. So you showed a few content pieces there um, that everyone can um, learn more on. If you could comment only one content piece, what, what would be the kind of the perfect next step after this? presentation and what should people start with? Um, I think the book that I pitched in mm. could be a great um, resource to know about everything that I talked about and much more. If you're not big on reading books, I would say Linux kernel uh, is the best way to like consume knowledge. It's something that I really like whenever I like, uh, whenever I have some free time, I just go to the kernel, the Linux kernel website and just browse and find new information. Yeah, I think those are the best tips. I always, um, myself, if I have, if I'm in the need to learn something new, I usually just go to the CNC of YouTube and just like watch a <laughs> a cube competition or something and these these kind of tips i think are always the best for sure yeah um i think if there is and so i think this is last call ish for questions do you have any other like wrap up words or comments for now mm. oh i almost forgot the most important part uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to bore you with the things that are interesting to me. <laughs> of course, <laughs> not boring at all, <laughs> but, but the interesting part is the best. Uh, yeah, and there's Wiz uh, saying, amazing, thank you very much. No question from them either, uh, but great that everyone had a good time um, while in the session. And um, yeah. So let's start wrapping it up. And if anyone has the questions later, just hop onto the Slack side of things to ask them. Um, so let's wrap it up. So thank you everyone for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It was amazing to have Reza here talking about multi-architectural Kubernetes clusters. Um, thank you so much for the great comments and great feedback for the session as well as today's show. We really appreciate it. Um, and tune in next week as well when we bring you the latest cloud native code every Wednesday. Um, next week, we will have Jason Morgan talking about introduction to policy with Linkerd 2.11. Um, thanks for joining us today and see you next week.